Hey everybody, welcome to Trading Futures with me, Anthony Cardelli. Today on the show, I'll be speaking with Principal at Totem Asset Group, Andrew Strassman, the President and COO of NCSA Sports, Lisa Strassman, Trader and Performance Coach, Dan Hodgman, and last but not least, Futures Trader, Danny Sitlow. Welcome to Trading Futures. All right, everybody, we're going to kick off today's show with Andrew Strassman at the charts. Andrew, let's start off by talking about the Totem Trend Index. Anthony, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and I look forward to sharing with you a few observations. Hopefully, your viewers will find interesting. The Totem Trend Index is uh, published every one minute of every trading day, www.totemasset.com. I invite people to go take a look. What we're doing here is we're taking a measure of a portfolio of 30 futures, uh, all the common big traded futures, and measuring the strength of the portfolio trend at any moment in time. We have over 5,000 data points going back to the year 2000. And here we are right now. Uh, what we do, we break these down into different quartiles in an effort to determine the market regime that we're in right now. And here's what I will tell you about trend trading. We tend to make most of our money in very short periods of high cross-market correlation. That would be consistent with a trend, val trend index value of over 50. So these tend to be, tr trend trading returns tend to be lumpy or episodic, and it, it has a lot of cross-market correlation, things lining up. Uh, as we see right now, what's particularly interesting, in this past month we've met levels we've only seen in 0.3% of more than 5,000 observations. So we're at a very low trend-less environment period, and we've been this way for a couple of weeks. That's also meaningful. So when I talk to people about trend, trend trading, um, I, I'd say there's a very simple thing. You know, what is a trend? And I probably shouldn't be, but I'm constantly amazed by how people, often longtime professionals in our industry, can't answer this question. It's amazing, isn't it? I know, it's, it is very, very, very simple. It is just this, uh, an uptrend, as we're showing here on a daily S&P chart, is a series of time series data making higher highs and higher lows. Higher high, higher low. Higher high, higher low, higher high, higher low, et cetera, et cetera. At some point, this series will discontinue and a lower low will be made. And that will be indicate the end of the uptrend. And occasionally, it will embark on a new downtrend. So very simply put, a trend is a market making higher highs and higher lows, and a downtrend would be a market starting from the top left going to the bottom right, making lower lows and lower highs. So we just gotta get that out of the way if we're gonna talk about yeah. trend, right? Hit the basics, gotta cover them. Okay, now next I want you to think about water. And it, water has three different phases. It can be a liquid, it can be a solid, or it can be a gas. Likewise, time series price data, or trends, have three different phases. You can be long, flat, or short. Markets go up, markets go down. Why miss out on half the fun, I like to say, on the short side. So what we do here, we assign a value for every instrument, and here's a portfolio of 30 different instruments across eight different market sectors. We assign a value of between minus 100 for a full short bias to plus 100 for a full long bias. And then we have waypoints in between just as a measure of strength. Next, we, take the, we have these data points for every commodity for every day. Read from left to right, I can see how over the past couple of weeks this thing has been morphing over time. So the rightmost column is the most recent value. Now, we take an average of these values to come up with the trend index, but since we don't care if the market's going up or down, because we're equal opportunity, uh, we take the absolute value. So this gives us a pretty good idea on a portfolio of 30 different things, this measure of a strength of the portfolio from a trend trading perspective. And what we've seen recently is very low levels. A couple of questions on sure. this slide. You mentioned earlier when we were looking at uh, the, the first slide, totem, as, totem Asset Index, you said 30. Futures. These are the 30 futures? Correct. In eight different market sectors, all the way from fixed income, equities, FX, metals, energy, grains, softs, and finally livestock. I, and I love the analogy about the water, right? Long, short, flat, three different uh, with water, too. You know, um, Short bias, long bias, flat bias. What determines 
that plus 100 or just 100 and the negative 100, what actually determines that? What's so behind the scene? So behind the scene, uh, no, I can't give away all the secret sauce, but let's say there's moving averages and chart structure. So there'll be uh, a moving average to give you kind of a lean bias, and then there'll be a medium-term breakout strategy, and then a longer-term breakout strategy. So gotcha. all in, con in conjunction is how we come up with these levels. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, here's a closer look. Uh, the past year of the index. And you can see these, these little markers here sh uh, delineate the different quartiles. So we were in the upper, upper quartile here, July into August. And you might remember there's a little bit of panic in the market. Long bonds, long gold was the de rigor at the time. And then for no particular reason, that reverse course. Uh, and now we find ourselves two, three weeks now below a reading of 25. And this is relevant to me. A um, couple of things are relevant. The speed at which it fell and just where we are and where we've hung out. Um, the, the, the speed that we fell from those recent peaks, this, this chart here shows the rolling one month change in our trend index. And one, two, three, four, five. This is, in the past 10 years, the fifth quickest turnaround we've seen from peak to trough uh, in the last 10 years. Sometimes that's indicative of a, a sea change in the environment, also known as an inflection point. So one could say with a, a degree of confidence that in September, markets inflected. Hold on, stay on the yeah. slide for one mm -hmm. second. I just want to go back and look at this. So the times before, I noticed that you put where it got there, QE1, QE2, QE3, you're just mentioning where it was. It was up there, ECB, and then all we are here, QE4 with a question mark. And I just want you to just talk a little bit more about highlighting different moments down yeah, here. Yeah, good to point. Why did that. So, you know, this is since the great financial crisis and the grand central bank experiment to increase their balance sheets. So, if a trend follower, we say uh, there's convex and concave strategies, trend following by its very nature is a convex strategy. We want markets to move. Now, central banks don't really want markets to move, they want price stability. That's one of their stated goals. So what they've done is they, by, by throwing uh, assets and money at the problem, what they're doing is sop mopping up any sort of excess volatility and keeping a lid on prices from going anywhere. And that is detrimental to a, a trend-following strategy set. One last thing before we go on to the next slide. I've noticed how you have a lot of times where it's dropped really quickly like that. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious what you've noticed after those instances. Yeah. Um, that's a great point. Um, we're going to, I'll show you just two slides. Okay. Okay. Um, what I've done next here is I'm taking a look at the number of days we've been under 25 in the index for a lengthy period of at least two weeks. So we are just in the past week uh, coming off a three week period, 22 days we were below 25. This is the longest of any of these instances we've seen in, uh, in the, really in the past 20 years. Um, so that's noteworthy in and to itself. But I would draw your attention to August of 2008 and April of 2009. What we're looking at, what does the S&P do after we exit one of these lengthy periods uh, in the doldrums, shall we say? And we're looking at 5, 20, 50, 100, and 200 trading days later. So this was an immediate precursor to the great financial crisis. And this was coming out of the great financial crisis. On the next chart, what I've done here is I've taken, I've put vertical lines here as we've exited each one of these periods. Now, I'm not going to say we can hang our hat on this with any sort of certitude, but there do seem to be several instances uh, that I've marked here. This, this red one here, that was a precursor to the great financial crisis. This one here was coming out of the great financial crisis as quantitative eating was instituted. These, we had two very close side by each right here. This up move in the stock market was following quantitative easing three. And here we are today on the cusp of quantitative easing four. Now, they're not going to say it's quantitative easing four, but we kind of know it is. Um, now, on this, this next slide, what I've done is I've overlaid a very simple trend following model onto this weekly S&P chart. Now, the bars are painted blue when you should be long. They're green when you should be flat, and they're red when you should be short, you know, recognizing those three phases we talked about earlier. 
And then I've drawn this orange line right here, which has a whole new level of importance that we need to talk about. Well, hold that thought. Um, just to clarify, those levels that I had asked you about a few slides ago, that's where you're showing them here on the charts now, right? Correct. Awesome. All right, well, we're going to get to this question mark here in just a moment. All right, everybody, stay tuned. We'll be back. This is my headquarters. This is where I trade and manage my portfolio. Since I added futures, I have access to the oil markets and gold markets. Okay. I'm plugged into equities. Trade confirmed. And I have global access 24-7, meaning I can do what I need to do. Then I can focus on what I want to do. Visit your online broker today to learn more. Welcome back, everybody. Andrew, great stuff so far. We left everybody on a little bit of a cliffhanger there. Talk to us about why this 3049 level is so important to you. Ah, uh, yes, the orange line, the 3049 level. In order to discuss this, we need to have just a little bit of a stroll down memory lane here. First of all, we'll take you back to high school mathematics, and this is the Fibonacci sequence. Two plus three is five, three plus five is eight, five plus eight is 13, eight and 13, 21, et cetera, et cetera. The interesting thing about this Fibonacci sequence, which re reoccurs in nature, is the re relationship between these two numbers is constant. It's called the golden ratio. 0. 0.621 is 0. 0.618% of 34. 34 is 0.618 of 55, et cetera, et cetera, as you approach infinity. Now, the other interesting thing is you can take the 34, multiply that times 1.618, will give you 55. 34 times 2.62 will give you 89. And this relationship holds, and it reoccurs in nature. It's the length of your arm, of, your, of the height of your body. It's the uh, uh, hurricane takes this formation. There's so many, a pine cone. This, it just recurs in nature, and it's just a freak. I just don't know what to say. It's a uh, tail wags dog, right? So let's take you back to the 1980s. And we take the lowest low in 1980, and we take the highest high here in 2007. When the markets were in free fall during the global financial crisis, uh, where did they stop? They stopped at precisely the 62% retracement of that range which to me was rather shocking. Yeah, I, I've seen this stat before. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing, right? Yeah. And like, you know, why did it stop there? We yeah. could argue that all day. The important thing right now to remember is point B and point C. Uh, then quantitative, quantitative easing kicked in. They saved the day. Cash for clunkers, remember that? Yeah. So um, anyway, here's a B and C right here. We've got this range. 1.618 FIB projection of that range was this red line right here which the market went to and not through for a year and a half. It kept the market in check. And just to be clear, that's 2138. 2138 right? in yeah. the S&P, right. Now the 2.62 FIB projection, the next logical number in our sequence, is 3049, right there. And as we go to press here, we are trading basically right around that level. Yeah, we're sitting right around it right yeah, now. Yeah, so uh, I, I'm not in the business of calling market tops. But any good trader will take a level where they can set up an asymmetric risk reward opportunity. And this is a big, important level. Now, what I would suggest is if we were to fail here, it would stick out like a sore thumb. But if we were to get a minimum penetration through it, well, that might be something you could hang your hand on. So, Yeah, a couple of questions about yeah. this. Now that you have this level, and obviously you're going to be trading off of it, we talked earlier uh, in your presentation about the trend is still up, right? So if we fail from here, you're not getting short right away. Do you have to see the trend start to break down to where you see a lower high and then a lower low? Walk us through that. Yeah, great question. Now, how, like, how you trade it is really going to be uh, incumbent Executions upon the trend. everything. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. What I did here on this daily chart of the S&P Cash, I've overlaid a very simple trend following model on this as well. So once again, you're long when it's blue, flat, short, Long, short, flat, and it just got long a few days ago. So we're kind of at loggerheads here. If, well, I, well, I personally, what I would do, I mean, I got to lean to the long side here, but a failure to get through, and when that long turns to flat, maybe you want to get it short. You know, if we get through by minimum penetration, maybe you want to stick with longs. I mean, I, we can argue all day very good reasons why you need to be long, why you need to be short, but a good trader will just stick to their model, more or less. So, um, 
I don't know if that fully answers your question, but every trader is going to have to determine what they want to do with this level. It's a big level. Yeah, a level is just what it is. It's a, it's a level. A level. Right? That's why I always say execution is everything. You could tell everybody that this is an important level, but you know, for someone like me, I have to see the reaction, then I look for confirmations, Correct. and then I would start to get short. Minimum penetration, failure, what constitutes a failure, exactly. all these things come into play. All these things, yeah. Now, uh, I mentioned earlier about the central banks and their growth and QE4 is on. Yep. on. We're seeing signs of QE4. They're saying it's not QE4, it's QE4. They're increasing the balance sheet. When the balance sheet went up five, trillion dollars. We saw five trillion dollars in stock buybacks during this period, yeah. if that's any indication. A friend of mine, Dimitri Alexi from Alphabot, he showed me this chart at lunch uh, a couple summers ago. What he did here was he plotted in purple, inversely, the growth of the Fed's balance sheet. So this is the Fed balance sheet getting stronger because it's plotted inversely. Now, we measure CTA trend by the Barclays CTA index. And what this blue line shows is the underwater curve. So while they, were, while they were raising their balance sheet, CTA and trend strategies were struggling. So at lunch, I said to him, I go, you know, Dimitri, if you tack on to your data set the efforts of the ECB, that would explain the next year or two of problems for CTA or trend strategies. He came back with me a week later with this chart, and he added, this is the ECB increasing their balance sheet, and commensurate with it is the, another problem for CTA or trend strategies because they want to suppress volatility, and we make money if volatility goes up. So bravo you know, to the central banks. They've done a fabulous job. The question going forward is, will the patient reject the QE4 medicine or not? Will they find success? Um, is it turns out, this explains almost all of the stock market up movement and all of the CTA drawdown cycle with statistical certitude. Yeah, I love seeing the stats to prove something that you're thinking, right? It's right there in front of you. Okay. Um, now, I guess the last thought I would leave your viewers with, um, this is an academic project we put out called 40 and 20 out. And if you want to learn about trend trading strategies, uh, please visit the site. What we're doing here is we're taking from cradle to grave signals from a very simple trend following approach and tabulating the results. And there's a one minute profit and loss, loss curve. We take a chart, uh, a snapshot and a chart anytime a trade goes off. So we have this big uh, history of all these trades. And uh, if anyone wants to learn more about trend trading strategies, uh, then I would recommend them to go to that 40 in 20 out.com yeah the name's silly right now until you understand it and then it will make perfect sense andrew what can i say fantastic insight thank, thank you so much thank you all right everybody stay tuned because next up is dan hodgman with top steps moment of the week why trade with trade station it's innovative easy to use and totally freaking sweet with powerful tools to track and execute your trades and low per trade commissions on stocks, futures, and options. Upgrade your trade at tradestation.com. Welcome back, everybody. I'm now joined by Dan Hodgman. Dan, what's Top Steps Moment of the Week? Anthony, this is awesome. So it's a lot of fun as an equity trader when you get the opportunity to hear that term all-time highs, especially when you can take advantage of a trade, trading it right up to that all-time high mark. So today we're going to talk about Holm S. from Germany. He was able to make a really nice long breaking out over an overnight high, and he took this thing up and was able to profit with $1,200 uh, on October 25th. So if we kind of remember October 25th, we were leading into FOMC. Um, we were having good news out of the U.S.-China trade talks. So everything was primed for a nice little breakout there. And so simply put, he looks at his daily chart here. He's starting to frame things out. We find that we are in a really nice trend to the upside. Um, and we have this breakout line up here. Um, we are looking at this resistance, this long-term resistance that this market has continued to play in. This is actually 30.20 is the price we're looking at here. And so when we get a little bit closer here, looking on this 30-minute chart, the first thing he's looking for is where's this opportunity for the breakout? Where's this market going to give me an entry point? that I can be an asymmetric opportunity, meaning keeping my risk small while still seeing good profits within the trade. And he decides to take this price point here of his uh, overnight resistance that continued to play up. And once it finally showed a breakout, he, defined, he looked for a little bit of weakness here in that market, says, you know what, now's my chance. I'm going to go ahead and hop in on this trade. And instead of 
being greedy and taking it all the way up to the last second. He looks for it to slow up a little bit, has a stop or uh, take profit up at 3020 with his stop down below at settlement price for the prior day. A few questions. Bring them on. Uh, all right. First question is you showed us the daily trend. Is he a breakout trader? Is, he, is this his consistent strategy? No, not necessarily. He's just looking for what opportunity he's going to present. More often than not, we're seeing, especially with most of our traders, they're looking for the range. Um, but when everything sets up nicely for a breakout, it's hard to pass it up. Yeah, because the reason I asked it is because I think a lot of traders could have strategy drift, right? What's working today, and they search for it. Absolutely. So just getting back to him, when he, this is part of his routine, though. He looks for those types of trades, those Absolutely. breakouts. Absolutely. Uh, another question is, how many contracts was he trading? Did he get in all at once? You said he made $1,200, but Great walk question. us yes. through that. He was trading two contracts, and we'll see some traders will scale into a position. Some are all in, all out. Uh, Holm was all in, decided to take that chance, look for that breakout opportunity. And if it went against him, it wasn't going to be the end of the world. Um, look for that next opportunity. But fortunately for him, he was all in right at um, 30.08. Took it right up to 30.20 and uh, had a nice little payday for a Friday. So did his contract size, was it determined by how far the stop was? No, more often than not, he's sticking with two lots every time he trades. So what about the, fluctu the fluctuation in risk? Like how wide of a stop was that to, for him to make $1,200? That's a pretty decent stop. He was looking at about four points. Um, but with the confidence in the trade, with where he believed that this market could go, and with the possibility of a breakout, looking up to that 30, 20 point, it was almost like a magnet is what he was saying. Um, and he felt confident and taking a little bit of heat on it. Two more questions. Why a four-point stop? Came down or, to settlement price. So he was looking at prior to, that's, We've talked about this in the past. We've talked about settlement a lot. So he, he used something else from something that you and I have talked about with settlement yes. as a marker. Okay, if it gets back below there. If it I'm comes back out. to settle, then I want to reassess, look for that next chance. What determined his target? That was that resistance we saw on the daily chart. Oh, so it was the resistance. So he looked for a 30-minute breakout, and, and then he used the resistance. If you could go back to Absolutely. that, I just want to take a look at that. So it wasn't on the breakout here. This is where he covered? Yes. Gotcha. Yes. I see it. Very interesting. So it was great. a great trade. It was really exciting. Interesting stuff. Thank you, Dan. Absolutely. So just a couple lessons in execution this year week. First off, trend is your friend. When that market is trending in a direction, trying to be a part of that really is vital. Um, and when you are in the trend, don't buy when you see the strength. If it's an uptrend, find that weakness. Look for those weak spots within the market to find your entry point. That way you're going to be able to cut your risk down a little bit. Be ready to react to news. So like I mentioned, we had a lot of news coming out, and it was uh, you have to be cautious. Be prepared for those opportunities, and always don't be greedy. Don't feel like you got to take it to the last tick. Our job as a day trader is to take parts, pieces of that trend and turn out a profitable day. Great insight as always, Dan. Thank you so much. Absolutely. All right, everybody. Next up, Danny Sitlow will join us to share what's on our radar using Wuzzable. Stay tuned. This is my headquarters. This is where I trade and manage my portfolio. Since I added futures, I have access to the oil markets and gold markets. Okay. I'm plugged into equities, trade confirmed. And I have global access 24 seven, meaning I can do what I need to do. Then I can focus on what I wanna do. Visit your online broker today to learn more. Welcome back everybody. I'm now joined by Danny Sitlow. Danny, what's on your radar? Hi, Am. So today I actually picked a red sky reversal strategy in silver. Above trades above the 20 day moving average, it's a bearish alert. Okay, so this is a great one for me because I use this strictly as a correlating market with gold and then obviously how it relates to S&P beyond that. All right. So this alert is a five hour outlook. It's 75%. It's a probability of bearish alert, 25% a bullish alert. Okay, so I'm thinking to myself, this is a great alert. I want to know what's happening with this market. I want to know how it relates to the markets that I look at. So obviously gold and then beyond that, again, S&P. Let's check it out. Okay, so within Four and a half hours, a little bit less than that, silver hit the target, downside target, and then actually collapsed. 
at this time, and I think this is the most important part of this entire alert. So it followed through with the alert to the downside target and then collapsed. So is this typical of silver? I don't know, but how does it correlate with the markets that I trade? What are they doing? And so therefore, I actually go into the Buzzable Alerts and I look at all the statistics behind this type of indicator. How does silver respond to it? Yeah, so then I, that's on the third slide. The third slide then portrays the statistics on this alert and then beyond that, like I said, this is what I'm looking for beyond that is the back testing, the 10 years where it consistently is a bearish alert when silver crosses above the 20 day moving average. It gives me all that data so that I can say, okay, when this alert pops up on my wrist, I'm going to be eagerly aware of what happens and then watch my markets as they go on. I love how you're using this alert because everybody knows I always talk about confirmation. I believe yeah. that that's very important. So instead of you using an indicator, you're using an alert backed with statistics yeah. to give you a confirmation of where a market may go. And you can look at that and there was a pretty high probability. Yes. I mean, that's really great. That, that's getting creative, Danny. What about some of this stuff over here? Talk to us about what you're noticing here. I love these. These are the related stories and I think these are almost as important as the alerts themselves because it gives you an overview of what's been happening with the product and it gives you by date what exactly indicators does this product respond to and also what's happening in the world based upon those indicators, right? So silver trades, you know, about a month ago, silver trades 3% lower than the previous day close. A little bit later than that, five days later, trades again 3% lower than the previous day close. Okay. That's a big deal, 6% in five days. What's happening with this market? And then a little bit later, then it crosses above the 20 day moving average. What I like about this too, I always talk about finding a market that fits your personality. And if that's too big of a swing for you, you, you know, in, in that short amount of time, you're identifying with that really quick. And another thing I like about this stuff on the side is you can go back to those days, see what the headlines were yeah. and do some homework to see how the markets that you're trading were impacted by these types of moves. Right. Well, how could I have maximized my hopefully profit at the time, right, based upon this information? So if I get that alert that silver trades 3% lower, am I thinking, okay, it has the capacity to trade another 3% lower and then another 3% lower in the next X amount of days because I've seen it before and what did my markets, like you said, do over that period of time, because maybe it will be repeated. We all know markets have memory. No, absolutely. Great right. stuff this week, Danny. Thank, Thank you me. so much. Next up, everybody, Lisa Strassman will join us to discuss what traders can do to support their high performance lifestyle. Stay tuned. Why trade futures with TradeStation? You can trade over 80 products from home, work, or on the go with a powerful, easy to use interface and prices that let you focus on padding your wallet, not emptying it. Upgrade your trade at TradeStation.com. Welcome back, everybody. Andrew is still with us, and I am now joined by the president and COO of NCSA Sports and his wife, Lisa Strassman. Lisa, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. So, Lisa, you help athletes support their high-performance lifestyles. I always compare athletes to traders. Talk to us about some of the things that you do to help these athletes. Yeah, for sure. There's so many parallels. So the athletes that we are working with at NCSA are high school athletes who are playing at the highest level of competition, who strive to play their sport in college. And so it's a really stressful time for these individuals. Um, a few things that they do and that we help them with to manage that is, um, number one, they have their long-term goals. We help them make sure that they're focused on uh, what they want to set out for the long-term goals and then breaking that down into smaller, uh, smaller goals that they're working towards. Uh, time, time management is really critical for these high school student athletes. They're balancing competitive sports, academics, trying to make time for social life as well. And having really that, those great time management skills is critical. And then also having a really strong support network uh, their coaches, their teachers, their parents, and our team at NCSA are all here supporting them throughout their recruiting process. 
Yeah, all important things for traders as well. Goals, time management, you mentioned yep. balance. Your husband's a trader. He's been a trader for a long time. Uh, talk to all of our audience out there, all of our traders out there, and some of the things that you believe that you could uh, that they should some steps that they should take to help them support their high performance lifestyles. Sure, there's so many parallels. I was a competitive athlete and working with so many. There's um, so many parallels between the high school student athletes, college athletes, and professionals, especially traders in a high stress environment. I think um, the first example is having your long-term goals, being able to break them down into really bite-sized goals that you're working on every day, week, month is really important. And then that um, time management, really in the professional world, trading environment, uh, just work-life balance and being able to find things um, so that you know, you're know you locked in trading during the day, but then you can step away and take care of yourself, whether that's um, fitness, exercise, other personal passions, um, really being able to uh, have something else that's fulfilling when you're away from you know, your, your computer or your work. And then that support network is really important too for traders having uh, other people who can help you uh, along the way. Well, I completely agree. I know I wouldn't have made it without uh, my family and my friends that have helped me along the way. Andrew, let's go back to you. Are you doing any of the things that she mentioned uh, to help you support your, your high performance lifestyle? Well, it, it's true that the work-life balance is so important. And for example, when it comes to trading, uh, if you're up a bunch of money, you don't go uncorking any champagne. You've got to control the highs and you've got to control the lows. So when you're doing well, you want to store some of that away for those down periods, which will eventually come. You don't want to get too downtrodden. And the other thing that's probably the closest parallel would be the discipline. You know, and the discipline is so important, which is why I like to use a rules-based trading approach. And when I don't have discipline, well, she'll find it for me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, one thing uh, before we let you go, what, what would you say to a trader out there that's, that's trying to develop these things that you talked about? What would be the first step for them to start doing the things you mentioned? I think um, having a plan. Writing down goals is so important. Sometimes you can mean to do things and then you get busy in your day and you forget about uh, everything that, that, uh, that you had set out to do. So really writing down your goals, that goal might be exercise for a half hour before work, that goal might be um, things that you want to achieve within your work in that day, but having a plan, writing it down, I think is always a great first step. I love it. All right. Tell us where people could go to learn more about you and NCSA. Yeah, I think so. NCSA, Next College Student Athlete. We help high school student athletes who aspire to play their sport at the collegiate level and ultimately help them to find the right college fit. You can find us online at ncsasports.org. Lisa, this was awesome. Thank you so much. Andrew, thank, thank you, you so much for joining me as well. Hey, everybody, thanks for tuning in today. You can catch all of the episodes on anthonycardelli.com, and you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. See you next time. All right, Anthony, let's see if I still got it. I got it.